I want to also thank Pastor John and Pastor Jeremy for the opportunity to come before you this morning and share with you what I believe God has laid on my heart. I was told that I could take as much time as I wanted because this is the late service, right? <laughs> so I hope you brought a lunch. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but it does remind me of a little story, though. Uh, a father and his son were in the foyer or the breezeway of the church waiting for service to begin. And the little boy spotted a plaque on the wall. And he walks up to the plaque and sees all these names of people on the wall. And he didn't recognize any of them. So he looked up at his dad and he said, Dad, who are all these people whose names are on this plaque? And his dad looked down and said, well, son, those are all of those who have died in service. And the little boy, with a concerned look on his face, looked up and said, uh, was that the morning service or the late service? <laughs> Hopefully nobody will be falling out this morning. I realize that many of you may be facing difficult circumstances as you come to church this morning. I know that some of you may be facing difficulties as the result of the pandemic. Some of you may have recently experienced a loss, possibly a loss of employment, a loss of your means of taking care of yourself financially, and you're facing an uncertain future. Maybe some of you are concerned about the political direction of our country. Whatever your brand of trouble may be, I think we can all resonate this morning with the fact that we are certainly living in troubling times. Amen? Our generation has seen the longest war in our country's history a global pandemic and the associated worst economic downturn since the Great Depression and record levels of job losses. In many places and in many ways, our country is becoming a more frustrated and a more frustrating place to live. We've just completed a, 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 a series on Ecclesiastes, a collection of wisdom writings Writings which, by and large, highlight for us the futility and the resulting frustration that comes from living a life under the sun, which we learned is a metaphor for life without God. Now, certainly most would agree that it's one thing to spend your life living according to the carnal appetites of the flesh, only to wake up one day and realize the error of your ways. It's another thing entirely to live your life in service to God and still be entering into a season of suffering, the likes of which many of us have never seen before. Many of you may be experiencing that right now, this very moment. You may be in a season of turmoil and trouble. And you've come here this morning, hopefully looking for answers, trying to understand better why God would allow such a season in your life. But you know, if we're honest, you couldn't really tell it by the way we tend to greet one another when we come to church. You know, many of us in church world have been wearing masks long before COVID hit. And we even have a name for it. We call it our church face. You know what I'm talking about. We get up on Sunday morning, like most mornings, we drink our coffee, we eat our breakfast, and we rush the kids off into the bath or into the shower we check ourselves to make sure that we look better than we did when we rolled out of bed before we leave. Aren't you thankful for that? Amen. I know my wife is thankful that I didn't come here the way I looked when I rolled out of bed. We rush the kids off to the, to the car and pile in and we're off on our way to church. Before you know it, we're arguing about what we're going to eat for lunch or where. We're yelling at the kids to stop fighting with each other. Oh, and that guy that cut us off on the way into the church parking lot hate that when that happens but before we get out of the car we look in the mirror and we make sure everybody knows okay well we're going to church now so straighten up we put our church face on and we walk in and we're greeted and we usually have some kind of canned response back something like fine how are you oh we're just in love with jesus today oh and my personal favorite too blessed to be stressed you know, church face. Oh, don't look at me all spiritual. I know some of you know what I'm talking about up here. You may have even had a conversation like that on your way into church this morning. I wonder how many of us truly know that God is much bigger 
than our blatant honesty. That God is big enough to allow us to tell him how we really feel. And that church is a place for the broken to come to get healing. But sometimes we get this picture in our mind about what it means to be a good Christian. And if you ask most, they'd probably immediately conjure up some type of a list. A list of things that you have to do or have to say or have to feel. And we may have another side of that list, a list of things you can't do, things you can't say, things you can't feel. The problem with this performance-based type of living is it always leaves us with a confused idea about who God truly is and frustrated about who we really are. Because down deep inside, when we're by ourselves and alone with our thoughts, we know who we are. We know what we're struggling with. We know the thoughts that come through our mind. We know the fears and the pain and the doubts. We're aware. We're just not too keen on letting other people know about it. So we put our church face on. And we come to places like this church. One of the things I have always grown to love and appreciate about David was his willingness to be blatantly honest with God about what he was feeling. His willingness to let God know about all the good and the bad and sometimes even the irreverent, downright ugly. He just got messy before God. And he didn't mind letting God know when he was frustrated about God's decisions or his management style. Ever felt that way? Ever struggled like that? Have you ever felt as though maybe you just want to go out in the backyard and scream? Ah! Some of you just woke up. <laughs> what? <laughs> I've felt that way. There have been times when frustration reaches uh, such a height, it's hard to escape. You feel like you're under pressure. Things are boiling up. And you don't know where to turn with that. David felt that way too at times. One such time is recorded for us in the 13th Psalm. So if you will, please turn in your Bibles with me to Psalm 13, or swipe and click, or whatever you tech-savvy tech kids are doing today. And I'll read for you out of the New King James. This morning's message is titled, Total Trust in Troubling Times. Total Trust and troubling times. Let's read. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will you let my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I prevailed against him. Lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. We have for us a memorial that David has erected in the form of a song. He tells us that this is a psalm of David. There is no mistaking who wrote this, and he wrote it to the chief musician. It was intended to be turned into a song. Although it might be a little confusing, since how it starts as kind of more of a protest than a praise. More of a protest than a prayer even. And four times in these first two verses, David asks, why and how long? David's protest in verses one and two remind us how we feel when we're entering into these seasons of suffering and turmoil and difficulty and uncertainty and 
those times when our faith may be shaken at their very foundation. He asks, how long will you forget me? How long will you hide from me? We can all probably relate to the feeling of being overlooked or rejected or abandoned. Most of us have experienced that at one point or another in our lives. But this is something much deeper than just not being chosen for the ball team or being chosen last. This is much deeper than finding out that maybe a trusted friend has been unfaithful to you or dishonest to you or a spouse has been unfaithful. This is that terrible feeling that God, the one true constant, the ever reliable source of love and favor in David's life, the greatest power and presence in the universe has forgotten David and ceased showing him the kindness that he once enjoyed. I think David's probably been feeling this way for quite some time before we have this song written down for us. People, when they're suffering, tend to ask immediately, why, God, why? Why would you allow this to happen in my life? Why would you let this terrible thing occur? Why have you done this to me? Hopefully, once we return to our senses, we come to the place where we stop asking why and we begin to ask when. We sort of settle into the reality of it. And we think, okay, I'm here. How long do I have to stay here? How long are you going to allow this thing to be in my life? How long before I begin to feel better, things improve? David's not really putting, or petitioning rather, God for his favor or even relief at this point. He's just explaining his complaint, voicing his protest. He's venting his frustration at what appears to him to be God's indifference and unkindness toward him. David's feeling like he's been abandoned by God. Have you ever felt that way? I know we don't like to admit that in church circles because people might think ill of us or maybe they see past our church mask. But in reality, we're suffering inside, we're broken, and we're frustrated, and we don't know why God's allowed this, and we're not sure how long he's going to let it continue. David continues his frustration with God in, verses, in verse 2 by asking two questions. How long, Father, will I have to do your job and console me? I have to talk myself into feeling better. How long will you let that happen? Have you ever felt as though I'm just sick of trying to make myself feel better about these situations? I'm sick of trying to build myself up so I can get enough strength together to walk out the door and face the day. He asked, how long will you let me suffer this loss? How long before you restore me? And even though we don't actually know what circumstances David was facing at this moment, we can certainly relate to this feeling, like God has left us. God's not interested in hearing from us. Maybe God's even rejected us. Maybe we can better relate to it because we don't know what David was going through. Ever felt as though God just isn't listening? Or worse, just doesn't care that you're suffering? If you have, and if you are perhaps feeling this way, you should know that you are in good company. And not just with David either, although his company would certainly be good company to be in. You might be thinking, well, you know, David, he had all these pressures and challenges in his life. I'll never be a king. I don't know what that's like. I don't know what the daily pressures of just trying to run a kingdom is like. I've never had anyone actively trying to pursue me so he could kill me. I don't know what that's like. Perhaps a more contemporary example would better resonate with you. C.S. Lewis was a theologian and a Christian apologist in the 20th century. He lived in Oxford, England during his adult life and enjoyed a prolific literary career, as well as serving as professor of literature for both Oxford and Cambridge universities. 
Although for most of his life he showed no interest in marriage or relationships at all, he did eventually fall in love and marry the love of his life at the age of 57. But tragically, just three short years later, his wife, Joy, died of bone cancer. The book, A Grief Observed, is a collection of memoirs written by Lewis in which he describes his intense grief over the loss of his wife and the struggle that he faced regarding his faith and the goodness of God during this mo these moments. Published posthumously, many of the candid struggles shared by Lewis during what most would argue were some of the darkest moments of his life are still providing encouragement and continue to cause us to want to march the march of faith. During one such struggle, C.S. records for us the following observation about God. When you're happy, he says, so happy that you have no sense of needing him, so happy that you're tempted to feel his claims on you as an interruption. If you remember yourself and turn to him with gratitude and praise, you will be, or so it feels, welcomed with open arms. But go to him when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain. And what do you find? A door slammed in your face and the sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. Have you ever been through a season in your life where you were feeling like maybe CS was feeling here? Like God had ushered you out of the throne room of grace and slammed the door behind you and bolted it shut from the inside? I believe that if we're truly seeking God and living our life for Him, at times we're going to experience grief and pain so intense that we may feel like there is no possible relief. There is no last-minute reprieve coming. There is no 11th-hour stay to be granted. We may even feel as though we discover that the only thread of hope we have been clinging to, that of the goodness and kindness of God, cannot bear under the trouble, the weight of our trouble, and it snaps and plunges us into the deepest, de deepest depths of the valley of despair. Ever been in the valley of despair? I have. I think David has. What are we to do at such times? Where can we turn? Who will save us from this misery? Who will shorten our suffering? It seems David is having a similar experience here. He's feeling the apparent absence of God in his circumstances. David is feeling that his circumstances may have somehow escaped the attention of God. It seems in opposition to what he's come to believe about God up until that moment and about his constant care for him. There seems to be a fragmentation here. David is desperately trying to put all the pieces together to make sense, trying to find some reason to keep going. He is struggling with the same sort of struggle that people often struggle with when they ask that age-old question, if God is so good, why do these bad things keep happening to me? Ever struggled in that fashion? Ever been so broken that you cried out to God, why? When? Henry Blackaby, in his book, Experiencing God, Knowing and Doing the Will of God, he records for us that any time we try to view God through the lens of our circumstances, we will always be left with a skewed reality of who God truly is. Many of us try to view God's goodness. We try to view God's intentions, his agenda, through the lens of our pain, through the lens of our circumstances. But we need to know that there is always a purpose in the pain. There is always a reason for the suffering. God does not allow us to enter into these valleys lightly. Nothing you are experiencing or ever could experience has not first been filtered through his loving fingers. He's allowed this season in our lives for a reason, for a purpose. 
And I know that many well-intended Christians will say things like, well, you know, God won't put more on you than you're able to bear. Ever heard that? Ever said that? Well, in this context, this is actually a misreading and an improper interpretation of that passage in 1 Corinthians 10, when Paul is talking about bearing up under the pressure of temptation, not suffering. Bearing up under the pressure of suffering is something entirely different. I've personally found that God will often put more on me than I can bear. If for no other purpose but to drive me to my knees in recognition of my desperate dependence on Him. Now in these two verses, we might look at this and think that this looks like the beginnings of an impetuous rant. David's protest. But as we read on, we see that David is returning to his senses, forcibly making his way back from the edge of the abyss. I love this example that David gives to us, both in his raw transparency and his willingness to just let us know what he was feeling and what he was crying out to God, because it sort of upsets our idea of who we think a good Christian ought to look like or how they ought to behave or what they ought to feel. David also knows that God is much bigger than his frustration and that God is still David's only true source of hope. And so we turn to God's or to David's petition in verses 3 and 4. Consider and hear me, O oh my God, Enlighten my eyes, lest I should sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies should say I have prevailed against them. Lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. How many know sometimes it is a terrible thing to hear the people that think you are falling to rejoice over your pain? How many of you have ever experienced that? You know that there are people around you that just want to see you fail. They just want to see you fall. And they may even want to see your faith in God fail. David's kind of feeling that here, I think. It's very hard to pray for anything other than relief when you're facing this kind of suffering. But often, relief doesn't come. We don't like pressure. We want our Christianity to be comfortable. We often don't want to go through the things that actually produce Christ-likeness in our lives. We'll have to go through some stuff to pray the way David's praying here. We'll have to experience some pressure to pray like this. We'll have to endure some heat to pray like this. But we don't like that. It's been said that the church in America has far too many degrees in the pulpit and tar far too little temperature in the pews. We like our sermons guilt-free. We want our Christianity comfortable. And we want our maturity drive-through ready. We want glorification without sanctification. We may even be tempted to bargain with God during seasons like this. God, if you just get me out of this mess, I'll dot, 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 fill in the blank. Or God, if you just give me a better husband, I'll be a better wife. Or God, give me a better boss and I'll be a better employee. But God isn't looking for bargaining. God is after brokenness. And we really don't like brokenness. We would prefer to run to the phone than the throne if we're telling the truth because we seek the words of comfort that a friend might be able to offer. We don't really want to look at the problem in our own life. We don't really want to look at the cracks in our faith. We don't like suffering. And yet suffering may be the very thing that God has ordered up for us. Brokenness is often the purpose in suffering, the place where we learn things about God and about His goodness and about His love for us and about his power and provision. Things we simply could not learn on the mountaintop. 
It's been said that very few things grow on the mountaintop. The view is wonderful, but all the lush growth is down in the valley. We don't like being in the valley because we can't see where we're going. It's also during these times, perhaps, when people might be watching us and we think to ourselves, you know, wouldn't it be a great testimony if God were to deliver me out of this trouble in front of everyone? That'd be great, right? In fact, God might be working a far greater testimony by providing you the courage and faith to continue even in the face of no deliverance at all. David may have begun by asking for change in his circumstances, that's true, but it seems that there has been some kind of shift away from that here. This seems to be a different pursuit, a different kind of petition. One where David is petitioning for change, but not in his circumstances, but in his own perspective. He asked God, enlighten my eyes. Show me what you're doing. Help me see above the clouds. Help me to know that you have a purpose to this. You know, it's been said it's awful hard to see or believe that the sun is shining when all you can see are the clouds until you get above them. So how do we get above the clouds? How do we get to the place where we can see the sun shining again? Psalm 37, verse 4, David writes a profound truth. Many of us have heard this a lot of times. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will grant you the desires of your heart. We like promises like that, amen? We like that God's going to give us the desires of our heart. We tend to gravitate toward that, and we completely miss the foundation on which that promise is built, that we delight ourselves in the Lord. So what does that mean? What does it mean to delight ourselves? What does that look like? When we delight ourselves in something, it's the thing we find pleasure in. And when we find pleasure in something, we want to spend time with it. When we find pleasure in God and our relationship with Him, we'll want to spend time with Him. And spending time with God is the surest way for change. Maybe not in our circumstances, but certainly in us. It's been said that proper petition before God is not asking him to change his plan to fit your will, but asking him to change your will to fit his plan. How many know that's the way we need to pray? That's the way I want to pray. It reminds me of the story of the father, the son, and the bicycle. Now, you may have heard this before, but if you have, please don't stop me because I really like this story. There was a little boy about to be five, turn five years old. He's just weeks away from his birthday. And his father had it on his heart to buy him a new bicycle for his fifth birthday. He had already picked out the perfect bike, had all the right bells and whistles, the right color. All the details had been looked after. The only problem was the little boy had not yet asked for a bicycle. And as far as the father knew, the little boy hadn't even occurred, the thought hadn't even occurred to the little boy that a bicycle might be exactly what he wants. But the father moved on. It was in his heart to give it to him. And so he bought the bicycle, put it away. And for the next couple of weeks, he began to plant seeds in the little boy's heart by spending time with him and telling him about all the good things that would come if he just had a bicycle pointing out all the neighborhood kids when they were riding around on their bicycles, having a great time and laughing and enjoying their, themselves, enjoying their bicycle. The dad kept pointing that out to the little boy. For weeks, this went on until the day before the little boy's birthday, and it came time for the father to ask the son what he wanted. What do you think the little boy wanted? He wanted a bicycle. I know it's shocking, right? And what do you think he got? He got exactly what the father had purposed to give him all along. He just needed to mold and fashion the little boy's heart to want what the father wanted to. 
And that's what happens when we spend time with the Father. That's what happens when we seek His face in the midst of terrible circumstances, when we fight through the pain and bring our petitions before Him. When we spend time with the Father, He changes our heart. That's why promises like this are written in Scripture. God will, God will certainly grant the desires of our heart when the desires of our heart are the desires of His heart. But the only way that can happen is to spend time with Him, to allow Him to plant those seeds in our heart, to bring about the change that if we're honest in our spirits, we really long for, not just in our circumstances, but change in us. We may ask God to remove the circumstances from us, and we may hear, no, my child, but I will walk with you through them. And that can bring us comfort when our hearts are aligned with His. We may ask God to make things better, and we may hear, no, my child, but I will make you better. We may ask God to make it hurt less, and we may hear, no, my child, but I'll hurt with you until you can feel joy again. We may ask God to calm the storm, and we may hear, no, my child, but I will calm you in the midst of the storm. David here believes that God is God no matter what his experience may be suggesting to him at this moment. David totally trusts God, even though he can't feel God's presence. Even though he can't see God's activity, David believes that God is still there and that nothing he's going through or could experience in his life could change that. And so David brings his petition before the Father. I think realizing that God may be trying to show him something, teach him something that he's not yet learned, possibly remind him of something that he had forgotten, and trusting that God is still listening, and still there, and still loving him. He asked God to enlighten him. Show me, Father. He's gone from asking, why, God, why? And when, God, when? To, what, God? What? What are you trying to show me? What are you trying to do in my life? What will bring you the greatest glory? which leads us to David's only proper response, and that's his praise in verses 5 and 6. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, because he has dealt bountifully with me. Even though there's been no relief, no change in his circumstances, no removal of the trouble, David remembers God's goodness and his mercy. Many will struggle with praising God in the midst of trouble. They may be, as it seems, waiting. Waiting until the trouble passes before they offer thanks. Possibly waiting until they feel like praising again. They come to church broken and they instinctively know that God is their only hope and yet they can't bring themselves to praise him. Have you ever noticed that it's easier to act your way into the right kind of feeling than it is to feel your way into the right kind of acting? Sometimes we just have to tell our feelings to shut up. Stop yelling. Our feelings are fickle, and as such, they make a very poor guide. Alistair Begg put it this way, we need to bring our emotions underneath the jurisdiction of God's character and of God's purposes. And David here is bringing his emotions under God's jurisdiction. He's certainly not discounting the reality or even the intensity of what he's feeling. He is, however, telling his feelings to get out of the driver's seat and back into the back where they belong. Because our feelings make for a wonderful passenger on the journey of life, but a terrible driver. We need to follow David's examples in these troubling times. We need to find that there is something that changes in us when we are willing to praise God in the midst of terrible circumstances. 
Praise for, forces, forces our focus away from us and onto the Father. Praise moves our perspective from our circumstances to God's purposes. Praise reminds our hearts of the love of the Father. Praise reminds our spirit of the power of the Father. And praise fixes our hearts on the desire of the Father. David realizes that God has been so very good to him, much better than he ever deserved. And it's that past goodness that deserves his praise here, regardless of his present disposition. God is and continues to be good. How many of us could look back on our lives and remember a time very vividly when God was better to us than we ever deserved? We can certainly remember those times. We know that God has been good to us. We know that he is the same yesterday and today and forever. God continues to be good. He deserves our praise, not just as an emotional response to our circumstances, but as a willful reminder of his permanent goodness. God continues to be good, and we should praise him for that goodness, for all he is, for all he's done, for all he is doing. We can praise God in the midst of our circumstances, and it may not change your circumstances but it will change you. It will remind you that you're in good hands, that there's a purpose for this season in your life, that you've not escaped his attention. You haven't somehow wiggled your way out of his love. You haven't somehow disqualified yourself from his provision. We often feel that way, but the truth is, the things that we think disqualify us from being used by God are often the things that God uniquely uses to qualify you for his purposes. Think about your suffering as God's preparation. God is still God, and you can totally trust him in these troubling times. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being you. Thank you, Father, that you have loved us and given us ample examples of that love. We thank you, Father, for our salvation. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that you have saved us from the penalty of sin, that you are currently saving us from the power of sin, and you will one day very soon save us from the presence of sin. We thank you, Father, that all these although these times may be difficult and hard to get through, we know that you're still shining above the clouds. We know that you are still good and you are still God, and we trust you now. In Jesus' name, amen.